need to introduce Stephen uh, Trom, who needs no introduction. Everybody yes, he knows does. Him. We all know him. Clean doctor. <laughs> he deserves an introduction, though. Well, he does. I'll give you a brief overview since... Um... <laughs> All right, I'm going to share my screen here. We tried this before, and it worked. So, of course, it won't work now. All right. So, um, yeah, my day job is a, I'm a hand surgeon. I've been doing it for a while now. And uh, I take care of a lot of musicians uh, at all levels from, you know, amateur to professional ones to, you know, a few famous people. And uh, I thought it would be a cool idea to, um, you know, just kind of give a very casual talk on uh, just the common things that I see in musicians and um, sort of give you an understanding. That way, if any of you guys have any medical issues regarding your hands, uh, you'll have a little bit of information now that you can take to your doctors and um, uh, have a better understanding of what's going on. But um, before that, let me um, let me tell you a little bit more about me professionally. You already know me as kind of a songwriter in the Dallas Songwriters Association and all the fun we've been having there. But I do have a day job. Uh, uh, I am a, a physician with a bone and joint clinic with my main office being in South Lake, Texas, although we also have an office in downtown Fort Worth, and I've been sharing time down there recently as well. Uh, let's see. So a little bit more about, again, my academic background. Um, I went to college at Emory University in Atlanta, uh, then went to Wake Forest Medical School in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, um, did a surgery residency at Mercer University, that's in Macon, Georgia, and then came back to Wake Forest to do specialized training in hand surgery. And so if you add up all of that time, that's about, I think, 14 or 15 years of training to, to get the degrees. Um, I'm currently a member of the American Society for Surgery of the Hand, which is the preeminent hand surgery organization in the country and arguably the world. I'm a fellow of the American College of Surgeons. I've been practicing over 25 years now. I am also a manuscript reviewer for the Journal of Hand Surgery, which is our flagship journal. And um, I was an assistant clinical professor at UNT because I helped teach the orthopedic residents at John Peter Smith Hospital. And on, uh, since this slide has been made, I've actually now become the collaborating hand surgeon for the Performing Arts Medicine Department at, uh, at UNT. So I'm going to get my professorship renewed again here probably within the next couple of months. And then uh, earlier in my career, I was actually the Honorary Surgeon General of Texas, and that's a whole story unto itself. Um, I'm not just famous for being a rock star. <laughs> um, I have had some uh, national recognition as a medical expert as well. I've been quoted in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, uh, I've been on radio and TV as a medical expert during you know my prime when I was uh, doing a lot of public awareness things for the American <laughs> Society for Surgery of the Hand. So uh, I have had some good experience uh, giving talks and uh, distributing the knowledge. Here's some cool pictures of people I got to meet in the past. Uh, here on the top right, that's Roger Staubach who's showing me his hand and telling me stories about how he dislocated his finger in one of the Super Bowls. Down here on the bottom left is Dirk Nowitzki. We did a public awareness project with him when he jammed his finger during the finals when they won in 2011. This guy here is a professional wrestler on WWE on television. So, um, it's Look been a how tall Dirk is. I mean, <laughs> you, yeah, just, he's you see ridiculous. him all the time, but we don't realize how really tall he is, you know, until you stand And, and there's a whole video on YouTube of me interviewing Dirk about his finger injury when he jammed it. So that got a lot of national recognition for that video as well. So, so that's kind of a quick trip through uh, who I am on a professional standpoint. So let's get to why we're kind of of here. This is sort of a talk that I, um, I've kind of mishmashed a talk that I give to medical students, but also 
uh, general public people. So I apologize if there's some terms in here that aren't obviously apparent to you, but I'll try to explain as we go along. But essentially, as a hand surgeon, um, when someone has a complaint about their hand or thinks something is going wrong with their hand, we generally look at, well, what are the symptoms? And that kind of helps us narrow down what might be going on. And this is just a basic list of the symptoms you can get in your hand. Certainly at the top, pain, your hand hurts. That's very common. You can get swelling um, or what we call edema. You can have numbness where you lose some feeling in uh, part of your hand. You can get tingling or what they call needles or pins feeling. Um, that's like when you go to sleep and you wake up and your hand feels asleep. That's that needles and pins feeling. It's a little bit more than just numbness. And then you can also get muscle weakness for some reason. Um, you can get loss of motion, like if you have bad arthritis and your joints are stiff and for some reason part of your hand doesn't move very well, that could be a complaint. Then there's paralysis. That's where you can't move it at all. That's different from weakness. Weakness, at least you can still move it a little bit. But if it's just completely paralyzed, that may suggest something different. And of course, the opposite of that is the muscles could be firing uh, abnormally. You can get spasms or like Charlie horses in your hand. Of course, you can have abnormal growth in your hand, like a lump or bump might pop up. Uh, and we call these masses or tumors. You can have a skin lesion, um, you know, whether it's like a skin tag or a wart or even a melanoma, and then little cysts, which are little sacs of fluid that can form in the hand. And then, of course, you can also get temperature changes in your hand where people complain that their hands are too cold or too hot. And a lot of times those temperature changes go along with color changes. But whenever a patient comes to me and says, oh, something's wrong with my hand, I start with this list. And like, all right, well, what, what are you complaining of? What, what, what's going on? And um, <clears throat> that helps me then decide of the many causes that could be causing problems in your hand. Probably the most common thing I see are inflammatory conditions where something's inflamed. And that's your tendonitis, your arthritis, anything where something's irritated. Um, nerve compression or pinching of a nerve. That's your carpal tunnel syndromes. But you can also have pinched nerves in your neck that then give you symptoms in your hand. Uh, so there, there are nerves that go all up and down your arm and they can get pinched at you know, several different points and depending on where they're getting pinched and which nerve is getting pinched, depends on what symptoms you're gonna have. As I mentioned, you can have neck issues that then cause things to radiate down into your hand. Uh, there are a lot of general medical problems that can manifest in the hand. Lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, um, a lot of crazy musculoskeletal uh, disorders, you know, muscular dystrophy, um, uh, things like Lou Gehrig's disease. All of these things can be medical problems that you have in your body, but then they can cause problems in your hands as well. And uh, as I go through this list, you start to appreciate that, wow, we got to figure out, all right, well, what's, what are you complaining of and how do we narrow down what's actually going wrong? What, what's the diagnosis? Uh, certainly trauma is common. You know, people punching walls, people getting punched, people being in car wrecks, people falling down onto their outstretched hands. But then trauma could also not be just one event. It could be a lot of repetitive events. And that's a common theme in musicians where they're um, maybe practicing a lot. It's a, I see that a lot in people that go to the gym a lot as well, or they write a lot. It's a lot of repetitive motion that can cause little micro or mini traumas that ultimately uh, cause a problem in the hand. Uh, of course, we mentioned new growths or tumors. Uh, there are psychiatric conditions that show up in the hand, um, whether it's people that are... Uh, hurting themselves on purpose, or they're doing crazy things that then injure the hand. Um, uh, but it's a lot of self-inflicted kind of stuff. Again, these are kind of rarer. And then just poor posturing and ergonomic issues, people that don't sit up straight at work and or use the, comp the keyboards well can give you, again, inflammatory conditions and overuse that show up in the hand. 
Well, once we add, as we also try to figure out what can go wrong, we have to think, all right, well, what's in your hand anyway? Because all these different tissues can have different things that can go wrong with them. Um, and so here's a list of the tissues that are in the hand that we, we deal with. Bones, of course, make up the skeleton. The joints are the kind of hinges in between the bones that move. Uh, the muscles are the things that move, actually do the moving. You know, the skin is the packaging that everything's kind of packaged up in. Uh, the nerves that give you feeling, but the nerves also are the things that your brain sends a signal to your muscle to move. So nerves go both ways. They give you sensation that go from your hand to your brain, and then they give motor signals that go from your brain to the muscles in your hand. The tendons are also part of the muscle network that uh, are, are strips of, uh, of more ligamentous or collagen tissue that, that move things around. The ligaments are also kind of things that hold, help hold the bones together. Um, so when you think of a sprained or a strained wrist, that's usually a ligament. And then of course the blood vessels that uh, both deliver and take away you know, arteries and veins. Uh, that supply the blood to the uh, hand. And any of these tissues can either be damaged or pinched or have something weird growing out of them. And that can be uh, part of the challenge of figuring out what's wrong. But I'm not here to give a big dissertation of the gajillion things that can go wrong in your hand. Uh, I'm here to kind of touch base on the common things that I see in musicians um, and that includes guitar players symphony musicians you know any instrument really and the most common things that i see that you've probably heard on the street is probably number one carpal tunnel syndrome and we'll talk about what each of these things are in a little more detail uh, trigger finger which is a form of tendonitis where your finger locks other types of tendonitis around the wrist or the hand De Quervain's tendonitis, which is a specific tendonitis that your wrist will talk about, that I see a lot, particularly in guitar players. Um, arthritis, of course, which everyone can get, but it, when you get arthritis in your joints, it's a particular challenge if you're playing an instrument, uh, especially if you're making your livelihood doing that. And then these little ganglion cysts, which again are benign little sacs of fluid that can pop up, in a couple of different classic areas that uh, can sometimes cause problems. So these are the main things that I see that probably make up, you know, 98% of what I see in musicians. So let's kind of break them down. Again, carpal tunnel syndrome probably being the most common, and that's a nerve problem. But here's a list of some other nerve problems that you can get that some people will confuse with carpal tunnel syndrome. Of course, carpal tunnel is at the top. Each syndrome is related to a particular nerve that's in the arm. And we'll talk about that a little bit more, but the three major nerves are your median nerve, your ulnar nerve, and your radial nerve. I'm not gonna quiz you on that later, but we'll, we'll, we'll probably repeat that concept a little bit more in the future. But carpal tunnel syndrome is the median nerve getting pinched at your wrist. Cubital tunnel syndrome is the ulnar nerve pinched at your elbow. And that's, that's going to be the nerve that uh, kind of goes more to your pinky. And we'll talk about that more. Uh, the ulnar nerve can also be pinched at the wrist, but that goes through a separate tunnel, what's called Guillain's Canal. Then there's a syndrome called pronator syndrome. This is getting now a little bit more rare. And that's where the median nerve is being pinched at your forearm and elbow area, not so much your wrist. But you have to be aware of that so you don't confuse it with carpal tunnel syndrome. There's a thing called Wartenberg syndrome, which is uh, a branch of the radial nerve that goes to um, basically the back of your hand, more between the thumb and the index finger, that little web space area on the back of your hand that gives you feeling there. And so you have numbness or tingling there. That may be more this radial nerve branch. And then, um, like I mentioned before, your neck or your cervical spine or your C-spine. Uh, radiculopathy just means problems with uh, nerves being pinched in your neck, uh, either from the discs or the vertebrae. 
And that's not something I take care of, but it's something that can mimic hand surgery problems that we have to be aware of um, so we're not confusing things. As I kind of mentioned, the three major nerves uh, in, your, in your arm and hand are the median nerve. And um, again, keep in mind, the nerves do both motor function and sensory function. And so as far as motor function goes, the median nerve controls the muscles at the base of your thumb. So it's very important for gripping and pinching. And then they also control the muscles on your forearm that flex your fingers so you make a fist. So that's why gripping and pinching are important for the median nerve. And of course, carpal tunnel and pronator syndrome are the things we see with that. Uh, the ulnar nerve, that's the one that goes kind of on the inside of your elbow. So when you hit your funny bone, when you hit your elbow, and they say you hit your funny bone, and you get that electric shock feeling, that's the ulnar nerve at what's called the cubital tunnel that you're whacking. And uh, the ulnar nerve gives you feeling to your pinky and half of your ring finger, but it also goes to the little tiny muscles in your hand that do a lot of fine motor stuff. So a lot of spreading your fingers out or bringing your fingers together um, and writing, that's all... Uh, partially controlled by the ulnar nerve. And then the third nerve is the radial nerve. Um, and that's, uh, that straightens everything out. So the median nerve flexes everything into a fist. The radial nerve is on the back of your forearm, mostly to those muscles, and that straightens your fingers out. And there are different uh, syndromes that can uh, affect that as well. And then this is just sort of a, a picture of where the, the sensation of these three nerves goes. Um, the median nerve here is the orange yellowish color. And as you can see, it's mostly going to your index and middle fingers, some of your thumb. It's mostly on the palm side. That's what goes to sleep or gets numb with carpal tunnel syndrome. The purple or pinkish area, or the lighter purple area, is the ulnar nerve, and that's mostly the pinky and half the ring finger. That's what goes numb when you whack your funny bone or if you have cubital tunnel syndrome. And then the radial nerve, which is that superficial radial nerve, again, that's the back of your hand, kind of at the base of your index finger and thumb, and that's what goes numb if the radial nerve is being pinched somewhere. And so, you know, me as a hand surgeon, I'm interviewing the patient and I'm asking all these things, of where are you numb, what are your symptoms, and that helps me figure out what, what all is going on. And uh, so the way we decide if you have a nerve compression syndrome or a pinched nerve syndrome is uh, history and physical. So I ask you questions, I examine you, but then the other thing we do to kind of make sure we're on the right track is we get nerve conduction studies. And... Um, Usually we send you to another doctor to get those, but that's the test where they put little electrodes on your arm and they send little electric shocky feelings down your arm. Some of you may have had this test in the past. And then the second part of the test or the EMG is where they put little acupuncture needles in some of the muscles around your hand and arm and they kind of read the electrical signal that they pick up. And by doing those things, they can figure out if you got a pinched nerve somewhere. Uh, other tests such as ultrasound or MRI can also be done. Uh, MRI is particularly useful if you're worried about neck stuff because the nerve tests aren't quite as good for neck stuff, but um, MRIs tend to be what they do. Um, if we do pick up on a pinched nerve syndrome, a lot of times there are, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to have surgery. And we'll talk more about the treatments for these also in a little bit. Um, but we do try to treat them conservatively at first, if it's okay to do that. Uh, and that the surgeries for these syndromes have become a lot less invasive. So we can do them through a lot smaller incision than maybe 20, 30 years ago. And so the surgeries are easier to have, easier to recover from, and are more predictably successful. Um, what else we got here?
So again, carpal tunnel syndrome is the most common thing that I see. And this is kind of a diagram to help illustrate exactly what's going on with carpal tunnel syndrome because a lot of people throw that term around, but they don't really know exactly what it is. Here's one thing, just because your hand hurts or because you keyboard a lot, that doesn't mean you have carpal tunnel syndrome. Carpal tunnel syndrome is classically, you're getting this numbness and tingling, electric shock feeling in your hand. A lot of times it can wake you up at night. Um, you can get some thumb weakness with it. And it's because the nerve, the median nerve, which is the yellow thing here, is being pinched by this ligament, which is the white thing, sitting on top of it. And we don't know exactly why it happens, uh, but the pressure in there gets too great and the nerve gets pushed up against this little kind of leathery ligament. And when it gets pinched, it goes to sleep, just like sitting too long and your leg going to sleep. And uh, so that's what carpal tunnel syndrome is. It's numbness and tingling or electric shocky feeling in your hand, mostly your thumb, index, and middle finger. Bothers you at night and it's not necessarily just hand pain. And so the surgery for it, if it comes to surgery, is we cut that little ligament. We don't mess with the nerve. We just cut a slit in that ligament. It comes apart, and that's what unpinches the nerve. And the, and the success rate of that is, you know, 90 95% or more. The only reason it's not successful is if someone has had carpal tunnel syndrome so long that they have permanent nerve damage and the nerve can't recover. And so we always try to, you know, tell people, if you're having numbness and tingling in your hand, make sure you get it checked out. You don't want to ignore it and just let it go on. Because with a lot of these nerve syndromes, if you neglect them and you just don't get them treated, because the nerve isn't going to the, sending normal signals to the muscle, you can actually get muscles to waste away, what we call atrophy. And so when the muscles waste away, they don't come back. You know, not even if you do the surgery later. So if your carpal tunnel is so bad that it's causing the muscles to waste away, you have to kind of be more aggressive with those. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, any questions so far about nerves or carpal tunnel syndrome? Yeah, I have it. Well, I don't know if it's related to carpal tunnel. I, I, you know, he, this commercial on TV talks about Dupuytren's contracture or something like that. I'm saying it right? Dupuytren's contracture. Yeah, that's completely different. Um, and, and I'll mention that a little bit later. Oh, okay. But yeah, that's a different problem, um, which I don't have pictures of. But uh, yeah, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but you're, you're right. That's on TV a lot. They're trying to push these injections for them. And, and I'll mention that a little bit here in a little bit. Yeah. All right, I'm going to move on to uh, basically the inflammatory conditions, which is going to be your tendonitis and your arthritis. Because almost everybody gets a little bit of arthritis and some tendonitis at some point. Um, so when you have tendonitis or arthritis, basically your joint or your tendons are inflamed. Uh, you overdid it um, or... You got cartilage worn out in your joints and, and they're irritated. And whenever something gets irritated, you get this process of inflammation. And, uh, and so the way we treat that is we try and decrease the inflammation in several ways. Uh, the most obvious one is you rest it. Okay. And, and maybe there's splints you can wear that help you rest it. But in the end, if you're overusing something and it's inflamed, you really kind of need to rest it. Ice is also good for inflammation. It kind of cools things down, decreases swelling. And it's better, and if something is inflamed, it's better to use ice than heat. Heat is good for stiffness, um, or if something's cold, you need to warm things up. But it's not good for inflammation because heat can make swelling worse. So if something's inflamed, like you, you whack your hand and it starts swelling a little bit, put ice on it. Uh, the other thing is elevation. You pop, prop it up, uh, again, to help with swelling. Uh, and, um, and then, of course, we have the over-the-counter uh, anti-inflammatory medicines that everybody knows about. 
Advil or Aleve are the common trade names, ibuprofen, naproxen, or other ones. Um, and then there are some prescription ones that are out there too. But the main ones everyone knows about is ibuprofen, Advil, Motrin, Aleve. Those are anti-inflammatory medicines. Not everyone can take them because they do upset your stomach and they can uh, cause ulcers if you're not careful. And then some people have medical conditions where they're taking blood thinners. And one of the side effects of these medicines is it stops platelets from working. And platelets are one of the things that clot your blood. And if you're already on blood thinners, it makes the bleeding and blood thinning worse, if that makes sense. So people that are on blood thinners have to be careful with those sort of things. But if you don't have problems with ulcers or bleeding from your you know, gastrointestinal tract, and you're not on blood thinners, those are the best drugs to treat inflammation like tendonitis and arthritis. Now, even if you do have some of those other problems and you can't take the pills by mouth, there's some stuff called Voltaren gel. Some of y'all have heard of that. It's actually an anti-inflammatory that's in a gel. It used to be prescription. I used to have to write prescriptions for it all the time, but now it's over the counter. You can get a tube of Voltaren gel at Walmart or Target or any drugstore, and you take a little bit on it and you rub it on the sore area, as long as there's not an open wound there. But you've, you've got some arthritis pain in your hands, you got some tendonitis, you take some Voltaren gel, rub it in, it absorbs through your skin, and that actually helps inflammation as well. I keep a tube of it in my drawer all the time. Uh, question, why, why, why do they say you can't take it for an extended period of time? The Voltaren gel? Yeah, I so think they're take more than ten or fourteen days or something like that, or something in a row. Uh, with the Voltaren gel, that it's probably okay to go beyond that. They sort of they're um, what what you find is they put a lot of things on labels for over the counter stuff, so that people that aren't doctors don't do anything crazy. Because uh, usually after that, if you're still having pain after that time, you probably ought to see someone. So they don't want you, it's okay to use it at first. And if it works, fantastic. Uh, but if it's not working, um, they don't want you to overuse it. And, and they want you to make sure you see somebody to the, who could then maybe give you advice. Yeah, go ahead and use it another two weeks or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right yeah so that the so you know Voltaren gel i have i have patients that use it for months and they're fine okay. you know you don't want to lather your whole body in it because it can it can build up i mean if you start getting a metallic taste in your mouth or a weird ringing in your ears you better stop okay. <laughs> but, but, but you got to use a whole lot of it to get to that point yeah um and then other things like steroid pills or steroid shots, we use those to treat inflammation as well. And then something new that just came out, you know, you, you've heard of CBD cream, and there's a CBD store in every strip mall nowadays, it seems like. And, um, and it's been around a while, but there wasn't always a lot of s true science to back up using it um, for things, but there's actually now some recent legit uh, science in the medical journals where CBD cream does seem to work for arthritis in the hand. And so, uh, I mean, it's not regulated. I can't write a prescription for it. You just kind of have to go buy some. But I tell patients if they want to, go try some CBD cream. And a lot of times that can uh, help the arthritis pain. So let's get to uh, a little bit more specific tendonitis. One of the more common tendonitis as I see is called de Quervain's tendonitis. It's named after an old Swiss guy. But it's a specific tendonitis because it's on your wrist at the base of your thumb. And so you get tendonitis there, which can sometimes be confused with arthritis of the joint at the base of your thumb. Um, but this pain is more on the bone and not so much the joint space in between there. But it's because there are two particular tendons, and you can see in the drawing, there are these two tendons that, again, go under this ligament, kind of similar to what the carpal tunnel looked like, but this time it's tendons, not, not a nerve. And those tendons go to your thumb. 
So people that grab a guitar neck, uh, you know, or you or use their thumb, you know, to to finger pick a lot, can get tendonitis in this particular compartment, and it's called the Quervain's tendonitis. And um, this kind of shows you where the classic pain is. And one of the tests that we do that help decide if you got it is we tell the patient to put your thumb inside your fist like the picture here on the bottom, and then you bend their wrist toward the floor. And if they get excruciating pain right where this red pain marker is, that's usually a positive test, which is called the Finkelstein's test, um, as you can see written down there. And so if you've got a positive one of those tests, chances are you've got the Quervain's tendonitis. And um, these almost always can get better with just a steroid shot. I mean, you can try the other things we talked about also first, but generally speaking, the steroid shot works the best. Uh, but probably in 20, 25% of patients, the shot doesn't work. And there is a surgery that we do, a little outpatient day surgery, where again, we open up that sheath. Um, here's a split that we use for it sometimes. But we, but we open up that sheath right there. And that cures it. And it's outpatient day surgery. You got a little gauze dressing on your wrist for two weeks. Then we get your stitches out and then you're done. And that fixes the Quervain's tendonitis. And I've done this surgery on a lot of um, like symphony musicians and that sort of thing. Because they're, they're, they use a bow and, and their bow hand always it has a weird posture and they get tendonitis there. Uh, the other common thing I see is something called trigger finger. And uh, you may know someone that have had this where you, you bend your finger down and it locks. And you may be able to pop it back straight, but you get this painful locking. The ring finger is the one that's the most commonly affected, but I've seen it in all the fingers at some point. And- um, Four times. Have you? Yeah. All right. So you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, it's a little bit more common in people with diabetes. We're not sure why, but we know just know that it is. Um, these also, 75% of the time, we give you a steroid shot. It fixes it. Um, if it doesn't fix it, there's an outpatient day surgery where, again, we open up the tendon sheath, and that cures it, and that works pretty good. The steroids work for me. What's the, that? The steroid shots work, work for me, but... Yeah, and they work in most people. Um, but there's, you know, about, like I said, about 25, 30%. You'll try a, sh a couple of shots, and it just keeps coming back. And uh, those patients end up getting surgery, but they do pretty good with it. So we can cure it either way. But then this leads me into that talk about the Dupuytren's disease, because a lot of times people come in with their fingers contracted down, and they think it's trigger finger, but it's not. Is Dupuytren's disease, and what that is, is that um, there's a layer of tissue underneath your skin, uh, in your palm, that starts thickening and forming these scar cords, and we don't know why it happens, but it tends to be genetic. And again, the ring finger is the most common finger affected, but in this case, the finger doesn't straighten at all; it's just stuck, and you can feel the cords in their palm. Um, and eventually, you know, the complaint I get is it eventually interferes with their golf game, and that's what finally brings them in. But um, it can also affect guitar playing as well. And um, in mild cases, there are ways you can treat that where you either just inject the cord with the stuff that dissolves it, and then you pop it straight, or you just cut the cord through a tiny incision and pop it straight. Um, the problem with those techniques is the cord is still in there. You're breaking the cord, but the cord's still there. And eventually, it heals back and goes back to contracting your finger down. It may take a few years to do that, but the recurrence rate after those techniques um, are pretty high. Ultimately, though, the definitive way to treat it is there's a surgery that we do where we make a little zigzag incision in the palm and we cut the cord out, and that gets rid of the cord definitively. It's a much bigger surgery. 
It does requ require doing some therapy um, afterwards to get all your motion and stuff back. But if your hands are contracted down bad enough, it's worth it. And that's Dupuytren's disease. So I mentioned steroid injections. Here's a little bit more about steroid injections. It's a, steroids are a very strong anti-inflammatory. That's why they work so well for treating inflammation. And I'm talking about corticosteroids. This is different than the steroids you hear about that like weightlifters or professional wrestlers use. Um, those are anabolic steroids, completely different class of steroids. This, these are things like cortisone or Decadron or Ketalog. They have a lot of different names and a couple of different classes for the different types of steroids. But they all do the same thing. They're all anti-inflammatory. And we'll mix them with a little numbing medicine or local anesthetic and we'll inject them into the areas that are sore. Uh, very common, you can get a flare reaction where it actually gets more sore for about three days or so. And um, that's a normal side effect. Uh, you put ice on it and it eventually goes away. But if you don't know what's going to happen, sometimes it can worry you a whole lot because it now feels a whole lot worse than it did. But that's temporary. Uh, in diabetics, steroids can make your blood sugars go up for a few days. And if you're a, a diabetic that's difficult to control, sometimes you got to call your diabetes doctor to see if they want to do anything. But if, they're take, but if you're taking insulin, all, sometimes all it takes is just adjusting your dose of insulin for a few days, and then you, get back, you come back down after a few days back to baseline. And then in darker-skinned people, particularly Afro-Americans, if you inject steroid, one of the possible side effects is it causes that area that you injected to turn white, <laughs> and, and that freaks them out. Um, it's called depigmentation. The good news is it's temporary, and it may take a few months, but the color eventually comes back. But those are the things that you got to warn patients about if you're ever going to do a steroid injection. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to fly through arthritis next, because that's something almost everybody gets a little of eventually. What arthritis is, is inflammation in a joint. And a joint is where two bones come together to make kind of a hinge thing, and it's usually coated with cartilage that helps it glide. So when you look on an x-ray, the bones aren't right on top of each other. There's usually a space in between them. And that's because cartilage doesn't show up on x-ray, and I'll show you that in a second. But you can get arthritis from trauma. You break something or you hit something, and it causes the cartilage to break down. You get an infection in your joint that causes arthritis. There are a lot of medical conditions that can give you arthritis, like lupus and gout. And then, of course, the most common is we don't know what causes arthritis, and that's osteoarthritis. And it does, there's no blood marker for it. There's no history of trauma. Uh, it tends to be genetic. It just tends to be wear and tear on your joints with age. Um, and, and that's probably the most common pattern that we see. And so well, what does arthritis look like? And here's a picture, here, here are two x-rays. The one on the left is normal. And this is a picture of the joint at the base of your thumb, which is probably the most common joint I see arthritis in the hand. And so you can see there's a little space down in here. All the edges of the bones look pretty smooth. And that's pretty normal. Compared to the right side, where now it's all clouded out and there's no space there, if you can tell, there's a little bone spur here, this little triangular bone spikes stick it up that's not present on the other side. And the not only that, <clears throat> but this bone seems to be like it's sliding off the edge of the lower bone. And that's all. A, th those are all the things we see on x-ray that tell us you have arthritis. Um, here are x-rays of finger joints, the tips of your finger. Again, on the left, you see normal joints where you, the bone edges are smooth, you have little spaces, a little slit of space in between the bones. Whereas here on the right, uh, it's all clouded out and the bone is basically right on top of each other with no space at all. And you got these little bone spikes sticking out. And that's what arthritis looks like on x-rays. We can't prevent arthritis or make arthritis go away. So the treatment of it can sometimes be challenging. 
Usually we start with therapy because you want to keep the joints moving as good as possible. Um, arthritis can hurt, but even though you're moving the joint, if you can put up with the pain, it's okay to do it. You're not going to make the arthritis worse. Uh, <clears throat> in this case, heat can help if your joints are stiff. But like I said, heat increases blood flow and blood flow increases swelling. So you have to be careful about using too much. On the other hand, ice helps if the joint is inflamed or swollen. But because ice kind of freezes things up a little bit, it can sometimes make your joints get a little stiff. So you have to go kind of back and forth with heat and ice when you're treating arthritis. Stephen. Yes. Uh, when you see people that have arthritis in their hands and so their knuckles are bigger, um, is that calcium deposits in their knuckles or what is it that makes their knuckles bigger? I know it's arthritis, but what? So in the knuckles, like on your hand, and I don't know if you can see my picture, but like if it's these knuckles, they yeah. get bigger. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of that, uh, some of it, and probably most of it, is your body is laying down extra bone. Oh, they're, okay. they're bone spurs, but they're not the sharp, pointy bone spurs. Uh -huh. They're more like mounds of oh. extra bone. Oh, okay. And again, that's a reaction to the inflammation. Your body thinks it's injured when yeah. it's inflamed. And so it's trying to repair itself by laying down more bone. So it lays down these little round, domey things of bone around the knuckles, and that's mostly what we see. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is calcium deposits. Sometimes it's the lining of the joint that's inflamed and swollen. Mm -hmm. And that kind of swelling can come and go. But like the little hard knots that you'll sometimes see, mm -hmm. those are bone spurs being laid down. But yeah. smooth bone spurs, not the sharp yeah. ones. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. You are welcome. <clears throat> So, if the arthritis is bad enough, and what I mean by bad enough is that it's either hurting all the time, interfering with what you're doing on a fairly daily basis, or it's very deforming and therefore interfering with function, then there are surgeries that we do to try and kind of salvage the problem. And, the, and, and again, the joint is shot. So the three main th surgeries that we do for arthritis is we can either fuse the joint, which freezes it, which means the joint doesn't move anymore, but at least it doesn't hurt. And if it was crooked, we can make it straight. And if you look at this picture down here of the x-rays on the left, there's some screws across these end finger joints and uh, those are hold holding them stable. That's like what a fusion would look like on a finger joint. And um, this patient would normally have sideways looking fingers otherwise and now we straightened them out and those end joints hurt so much they can't even push on anything or pinch it but now these joints are going to be pain free so that's fusing the joints we can revise the joint where we go in and try to do a clean out and maybe stuff some tissue in there to get, give it some padding that works okay in certain joints um, a lot of times that can wear out over time uh, but it is something we do and then, of course, we do joint replacements. And you've heard of that all the time, like hips and knees. And, you know, some of y'all may have some hips and knees replaced already. But in bad cases of hand arthritis, if you look on the bottom right, in certain cases, we do have little finger joints that we can put in there for bad arthritis that does preserve some motion so we don't have to fuse the joint. Um, Are these types of repairs going to cause you to... Uh have to give up fretting? Um, not necessarily. And keep in mind that by the time we come to these surgeries, typically your hands are so bad that you're not fretting anyway anymore. And we're trying to salvage some kind of pain-free function of your hand. And learn so play, it doesn't restore use a normal. Slide. What's that? Learn to use a slide. Yeah, or that. <laughs> Or uh, you, you remember those harpsichords or those auto chord where you push the button down and make the chord? <laughs> um, no, but I have guitar players with bad arthritis and their fretting hands. And yes, part of the part of the acceptance is that you're not going to be able to play like you 
could when you were younger. And I've, I've been taking care of, actually lately been taking care of some well-regarded older blues players. And they just can't play the leads like they used to. But they got to the point where they couldn't play at all without pain. And we're able to get them to play some without pain. And that's huge for them. So um, you adapt. Again, the, the whole idea is we're trying to keep as much function as possible with the idea we can't make it normal. But try and control the pain so you can use your hand with, without that kind of stuff. Um, the last little subject that I just want to touch briefly on is focal dystonia. And that term gets flown around the, the musical community a lot. And it's basically like writer's cramp or guitarist cramp, uh, where your hands just start cramping really bad. And, um, we don't know exactly the cause for that. And there's not a great treatment for it. Uh, but it, but some things we do know about it is, it could be abnormal posturing of the hand or cramping. It occurs more common in men than women. It's usually not painful, but it's just very debilitating. Uh, and a lot of times it's related to the specific task. So in musicians that play a lot, arguably too much, it only happens when they're playing their instrument, but not when they're doing anything else. And usually their exam is otherwise normal, their x-rays are normal, their nerve tests are normal. There's no test to really confirm the diagnosis, and it just requires a lot of therapy, uh, both physical and psychological therapy, to kind of work through it, to relearn how to kind of fire the muscles in your hand to get over it. And I don't anticipate, you know, any of us coming down with this, but it is something that I see at the uh, professional level uh, musician. And again, I kind of shotgun you with a ton of information here uh, and I apologize for that but I wanted to touch base a little bit on a lot of the common things that I see as a hand surgeon and musicians but uh, thank you for your attention and uh, I, I'll field any questions if you have them. Thank you Stephen this has been very informative. Yes thank you. Any questions? I have I have a question. Uh, I showed you a little bump in my uh, the thumb on my picking hand. Actually, we were on a gig one time, and it's uh, like on the knuckle right there. Uh -huh. And I forget what you called it. It's like right there coming out to the side. It gets in the way sometimes. It kind of gets bigger and smaller. Yeah, well, if it gets bigger and smaller, it's probably one of these cysts what we call a ganglion cyst. And, um, you know, you probably have a little bit of arthritis in the thumb. An x-ray would prove that for sure. But you can get this little outpouching of uh, capsule and fluid off the side of the joint. And when you're using it a lot and the fluid inflates the cyst, it gets a little bit bigger. And then when the fluid flows back into the joint, it deflates and gets a little smaller. It's benign, it's not cancer. Um, it's one of those things where if it's big and you want to try to make it smaller, sometimes we try to give you an injection. If it's bothering you enough, there's an outpatient day surgery we do to excise it. If it doesn't bug you that much, it's perfectly safe to live with. just gets in the way sometimes. <laughs> well, is it's it bothering you have to have a surgery? That's ultimately the question. Oh, okay, well, I'll, I'll let you know. Yeah, to ponder it a little bit. Hey, Stephen. Uh, I have a condition on the ring finger of my left hand where it's either the tendon or the ligament is, is showing. It doesn't affect my movement. can move it fine, but it doesn't seem like that. Uh, can you see that coming off the ring finger? Yeah, you have one of those Dupuytren's cords. What do you call it? it? It's called a Dupuytren's cord. Uh <laughs> Yeah, yeah. All right, I'm going to spell it for you if you want to write it down, because it's named after this old French guy, Guillaume Dupuytren. Um, but it's D-U-P-U-Y is the way it starts. And I, I, as soon as you put that, you know, in Google, it'll probably spell it out for you. Uh, but that's that tissue underneath your palm that's causing a scar cord. 
and yours is mild enough where it's not contracting your finger all the way down. It's just kind of there. Yeah. And that may yeah. stay stable for the rest of your life. If it doesn't interfere with anything, you leave it alone. If it becomes more contracted, then there are things we do with it. Well, I've, I've had it for many, many years and, and, you know, I, I have full control of my hand. It's not causing anything. Yeah. But so if everyone else can look at Bobby's hand there, that's what the Dupuytren's cord looks like when it starts out as a cord before it's actually contracting your finger down. And you can, and if you push on it, it's a very firm ridge. Uh, Put your so hand up, Bobby. You'll see on his ring finger, that little cord, that wrinkling there. Yeah. That's classic. Okay. Classic, Bobby. <laughs> oh, man, classic. isn't that classic? So you said that, that it probably never would amount to anything? Well, if it hasn't yet. <laughs> well, it hasn't, and it's been years. And, and it hadn't progressed in the last few years. It's probably just going to stay where it is. Yeah. I think the ring finger, so I think it's caused from being married too many times. <laughs> but, uh, um, and it does interfere with, with my nose picking sometime. But other than that, it doesn't bother me. That sounds like you've adapted well. <laughs> Well, all right. Well, thank you. I'll let y'all get on to your uh, critiques. Great presentation. Great presentation. Good job, Stephen. Thank you.